My name is Matt Rausch. It's the 30th of April, 1998. I am conducting an interview with Tony Randall in New York City. We will start by asking uh, you to state your full name. Anthony Leonard Randall. And your name at birth, if it was different. Arya Leonard Rosenberg. Any nicknames? Tony. Tony. And uh, your birth date, please. 26th of February, 1920. And city of state of birth, please. Tulsa, Oklahoma. OK. Well, as that is a segue, um, you grew up in Tulsa. I suppose we should start by uh, having you uh, tell us about how you grew up there, a bit about your mother and father, and um, what led you into the performing art okay. in Tulsa. Yeah. Uh, my father was um, an antique dealer. Um, he dealt in jewelry, uh, objet d'art, furniture, things like that. And uh, about the time I was born, uh, they had struck oil in Oklahoma, and he uh, came from New York thinking there would be a lot of new millionaires building wonderful new homes and wanting to furnish them in rather respectable, old-fashioned uh, antiques. I think he was right. I think he did rather well there, at least for a number of years. And he met my mother, and uh, who lived there. And uh, they were married and uh, produced my sister and myself. Uh, when I was about six, I started kindergarten in uh, Tulsa. When I was about six, we moved to Flushing here in New York, and then to Manhasset, and that's where I lived until I was about 14. And then my parents were divorced, and my mother moved back to Tulsa with her, to be with her people, her brothers, and uh, that's where I finished high school, junior high and high school. And then I went to Northwestern University, although I stayed only a year. At that time, everybody from that part of the world who was interested in going into the theater went to Northwestern University. And uh, I went to the School of Speech, where I studied speech and thought I was st learning acting. <laughs> and eventually, the um, head of the university theater his name was Garrett Leverton, advised me to leave and go to an acting school, which I did. And where did that take you? Right here in New York, to the Neighborhood Playhouse School of the Theater. He told me I should study with Martha Graham because she would teach me how to move on stage. That indeed happened, but he didn't mention that the acting teacher was Sanford Meisner, and that's what made the difference in my life. Can you elaborate on how Sanford Meisner, Meisner impacted on your uh, acting and your choice of career? Well, first, I would never use the word impact as a verb transitive. Fair enough. But he did have an impact on me, certainly. Uh, but I couldn't tell you about it. It was, it was two years of training, a very tough training. We had him every day, usually all morning long. And uh, I was 18 years old, and that's the very best time to be studying it. And uh, in that, in those two years, he thoroughly inculcated and inoculated me with uh, the principles of acting. Well, how did he go about teaching that, or is that something that's ephemeral for this uh, conversation? It, it, it can't be described in a way that would make any sense to the average listener, a little knowledge being a dangerous thing. <laughs> um, we worked on physical things almost always. If I told you that and you knew something about acting, you'd know exactly what I mean because there's another school that works on emotional things and we did not and I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. Well, did that lead to f early professional experiences? You were working in radio at the t uh, 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 shortly thereafter or did you go to stage? <clears throat> well, I, no, stage, but... Um, yes. In those days, there was a great deal of radio. There were hundreds of radio shows every week in New York, and very few people ever made a living on the stage, then or any other time. Yes. And we would supplement our incomes with radio shows. And your first experience in radio was in Worcester, Massachusetts? 
No, I was already doing radio shows in Tulsa. Oh, okay. And uh, when I got out of the Playhouse, I got a job in... Um, Mm, let me think back now if I have this right. My chronology. I think I do. I, at that time, the New School for Social Research uh, had a theater department run by the great um, Erwin Piscator, the mentor of Brecht. The, the New School was a mecca for uh, refugees from Hitler. Piscator was atypical. He was not Jewish. But uh, he ran a professional theater there, and I appeared there, and made, that's where I made my New York debut. Then I got a job with um, Jane Cowell, this was in summer stock, in um, Shaw's Candida, a lead, if you please, opposite the great Jane Cowell, who was then one of the great stage stars. And. Uh, I, w I wanted to get married, and I, I needed an income badly. And so I took a job in Worcester, Massachusetts for a year as a radio announcer. I was very unhappy in my job but very happy in my marriage. And I would come to New York every week on my day off and look for work. And I eventually found a job with um, Ethel Barrymore, in the Cornice Green. And from that I got a job in um, The Skin of Our Teeth, then in rehearsal with Kazan directing and Tallulah Bankhead and Frederick Marsh and Florence Reed. And before that opened, I was drafted. So that was my career. And then four years in the Army, and then I started all over again. And when you returned, you made your Broadway debut, I do believe, in Antony and Cleopatra? With Catherine Cornell. Mm -hmm. uh, my first job out of the Army was, was with Catherine Cornell in the Barretts of Wimpole Street. But that was touring. And then that fall, I was with her again in Antony and Cleopatra. By now, we're into 1947. Right. And at this stage, um, so you were... You were on a, st a stage actor at this point, a mm -hmm. working actor, and yes. uh, no longer participating as a radio announcer. Were you still doing radio at the time? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Until television came along mm -hmm. around 1950, I, like so many others, uh, supplemented his stage income with uh, radio work. In and I had re regular jobs. You didn't have regular jobs in the theater. You opened in a show and it closed in two weeks. Mm -hmm. But a good radio job would go on for years. Right. And, and pay for radio was more lucrative than stage work at that time? Oh, no. Mm. No, a 15-minute unsponsored show paid approximately $30. But you could pay your rent with that. Mm -hmm. And my wife was working, too. So between us, we, we had a pretty fair income. Now, most young actors and older actors <laughs> spend their lives unemployed. That's the way actors spend their lives. The Department of Labor has made studies of our three unions, and unemployment in our unions stands at around 90%. Only 10% of the actors make their basic livings out of uh, their profession. We That's a tragic situation. <clears throat> I'm the only actor I know of who was never out of work. Never. From the day I started, I think I had two blank weeks. How do you attribute that? I just blind luck, and that I was very assiduous. When I, all the time, that whenever I was working, I was also looking for the next job. Mm -hmm. I'd go out pounding the streets, um, making rounds, as we called it. You spoke about the year that you were a radio announcer not enjoying it. I'm curious mm -hmm. what about radio did not appeal to you or may have appealed to you as an adjunct to your stage work? I found it very uncreative work. You just stood in front of a microphone and read. That's not acting, and an announcer doesn't act in any case. But what I wanted to be was a living actor on the stage. Yes. Uh, making new characters. I nearly said creating. Mm -hmm. we, we, we people in this business use the word creating a lot. But advertising agencies use that. They have a creative department, <laughs> if you please. 
I think the best answer came from uh, George Balanchine, because I don't think any choreographer in history, except perhaps Bournonville, was anywhere near as productive, over 200 ballets. And someone said to him how creative he was. And he said, no, only God creates. I arrange little dances. So does an actor, what does an actor creates? I mean, or how do you feel about that? Only God creates. Oh. Well, that's modest of you. No, it's not. <laughs> well, no, well, not to you... compare yourself to God. Yeah, it's I mean, not so modest. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, um, so there was radio, but you, uh, to bring it to 1950, there came you know, an, an awareness of television. Do you recall the first time you heard about television, or the first time you saw television, or were aware of television mm -hmm. as, uh, as a medium? Well, you're talking about two different things, television and television as a medium. Well, at first I guess... Television existed, oh, uh, as long ago as the 20s, but it wasn't uh, developed well enough to be made commercial. Right. It wasn't until the war and the development of something called radar that the cathode ray tube was invented, not created. And uh, tel the, the latter television industry was based on the cathode ray tube. Before that, it hadn't been that practical. Mm -hmm. But I remember before the war, a man demonstrating television and hiring us actors so that he could uh, attract investors, and we would do sketches or whatever in one room, and his uh, investors sat in the other room. And the first time I saw television was at the Little Carnegie Theater on 57th Street. They announced that they would have television down in the lounge, mm -hmm. and it was Martha Graham doing Lamentations, if you please. Um, I had studied with the great Martha Graham. She was then still dancing. And that was the first television show I ever saw. Martha Graham doing Lamentations. My goodness. Uh, she was a pioneer even in that. I would say. Did you attend the 1939 World's Fair, which is one of the more famous demonstrations of the television? Yes, I did. In, I certainly did, but I don't remember t seeing TV there. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing the Aquacade. Well, what were your impressions upon seeing Martha Graham on a television screen? Well, there's no describing people like Martha Graham. They are tremendous personalities who have, uh, I hate the word charismatic, but they have a charismatic uh, effect upon an audience. They're mesmerizing. And uh, part of it was her extraordinary face. The rest was her art. But I've seen many other people do her dances and play her parts and, and dance them to some extent better than she could because by the time I was her student and saw her dancing, she was no longer young. But uh, no one ever brought that fierce intensity that you saw in the eyes. And that was caught on television. Was it? And it was very stark lighting as I remember. The whole meaning of lamentation was there on that screen. To lament, it was just. Well, when you saw that, did, it, did, it, did television seem to be a viable place for you to exercise your craft at that moment? I did not foresee its future. Mm -hmm. Certainly not its future as, <laughs> as the home of sitcom. Mm -hmm or for drama for that matter, or for mm -hmm. any of the other media to, to, to be out. Um, but, but it was not long before you began to appear on television, I would assume. Well, that was in the 30s that I'm talking about oh, with oh, Martha Graham. So the timing of that was in the 30s. So when television hit in New York around 1948-49, I didn't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't look for work in it, didn't pay well. And I thought it would, wouldn't last. Like the old joke, we didn't lend me five dollars till television blows over. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then it began to it, it began to show its power. Radio began to just fade away, and the big radio stars, like Jack Benny, stopped their radio shows and went on to television. Mm -hmm. For a while, they did both, but then one one saw that it was an avalanche that could not be stopped. And I got onto the show One Man's Family. Yes, it was not my first TV, but almost my first. And uh, 
From then on, I did a lot of TV. My entire generation can be called television babies. We all got our start in television. That is, not our start as artists, not our start mm -hmm. as actors or directors or writers, but we got our break in it. Right. And uh, you can name so many. And of the important actors of the world, uh, we always look to England for really important actors. We're not producing important actors today on our stage, but they still do it in England. But people like Diana Rigg yes. began, uh, came from mm -hmm. television, mm -hmm. and so many of us did. Um, well, if, if it wasn't your television debut, debut One Man's Family mm -hmm. uh, was, was, was your first steady uh, gay guy, steady I suppose. Steady yeah. Yes, and uh, it was a radio program before television. I yes, but I was not on that. Okay. Yeah. okay. It was a live broadcast, as, mm -hmm. as all television was. Can you describe the physical nature of that production as a live TV production um, for that particular show? I can't remember anything particular about that one that differed mm -hmm. from all the other live television shows we did, the Crafts, right. and the uh, Alcoa, and the Philco, and the Goodyear, and all those, uh, Play Playhouse 90, all of them. Oh, yes. They were all done uh, very much in the same way. You were in an enormous studio, and the sets were arranged around the studio. And as you finished in one set, you would have to run to the other set. and. Uh, during the scene, a stage manager would creep in beneath camera level and tap you on the ankle to tell you you could now run to the next set so they could begin the next scene and it would seem contiguous then. And they would come to a close-up on the person you were talking to who didn't have to leave the set <laughs> and he would continue talking to nobody while you were running to the other set. And it was madness. <laughs> it was madness. How did they affect costume changes and things you like that? You changed as you were running. Oh. Would you have dressers and assistants and people like that mm -hmm. sort of looking out for you? You just barely made it. Uh -huh. And often you didn't make it. Mm -hmm. But it was better then. It was live and it had that excitement. Um, the excitement of the new medium. Everybody was excited about it. And being live is exciting. And being on film is not terribly exciting. They have to wake you up to do your shot. And you try to get up for it, but you're not up. You have to force yourself to be up for your shot. Was there a sense of it being perhaps even an extension of theater in a way, particularly in the live playhouses, in a sense? I mean, you were playing to a, to a, to a, to a camera, but you were, you were live and you were in, in the adrenaline of the moment, it seems well, to me. Well, you know when you're good and when you're not good. You know when the material you're working with is good and when it's not good. You know when the director is good and when he's not good. And the young people who were coming up in television then were good. And so many of them have had huge careers since the Sidney Lumets and so forth. Right. They were good. And you felt the excitement. Of, Here's this young guy, he's getting his first break. They're letting him direct a show, Sidney Lumet. And he was, he wanted it so he... Uh, that was wonderful. You see that in early movies, too. You see it in Chaplin's movies. That's why they're better than anything that's been made since. Mm -hmm. uh, that excitement uh, of, of this new thing, this new toy, this new medium. There is a sense, as you're saying, that um, to make the likening to the silent era in motion pictures, that mm -hmm. the live era of television was that same. There, there are corollaries to be made between the two, it seems to me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the genius of it all, behind them all, was Fred Coe. Please talk about Fred Coe. I'd love to know your impressions. You worked on Phil, Phil Coe productions. Uh, and the good, show good, that good was year. the making of my career, Mr. Peepers. Indeed. Uh, Fred Coe. I've never met his equal. He had, at this time, he would have four or five shows on the air, all live, every week. And he would go from rehearsal to rehearsal and just watch a rehearsal and in a few minutes spot everything that was wrong and fix it. All in his head. He just was sit there. He had a very laid back southern country boy quality. And even though he'd gone to Yale, and I believe had his master's in drama from Yale, he still didn't know how to talk English. <laughs> he would say, he called everybody Pappy. And he'd say, um, uh, well, let me think of some things he'd say. To reprise, 
sometimes the joke is repeated in a, a running gag, you know, it's reprised. He'd say, when you reprieve that joke, he'd say, <laughs> he'd say reprieve for reprise, and things like that all the time. I don't know if he was being deliberately funny, but he'd, it, we couldn't, we'd be biting our lips listening to him talk. Yeah. But, but everything he said was right, yeah. but it came out in this, in this, he was from Alligator, Georgia. Oh my God. That was the name of the town. <laughs> uh, did you dare correct him when he was making a lap? No, no, no. He was the man no, in he charge. Was boss. He mm -hmm. was boss. And he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was brilliant. And he really invented everything that's done in television. The camera moves. And, so and the camera was then a great big clunky thing. He invented all those camera moves, everything that was done. And then when television blew over for him, he went to the theater. And he had, I think, five smash hit plays in a row. People don't know how good the guy was. Uh, well, th Mr. Peepers was your first experience with Fred Coe? No, I had done a couple of, uh, I think I'd done a Philco or a Goodyear, something like that. Mm -hmm. how, did the, how did the comedy series come to uh, present itself to you? How, 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 did, how, did you? how did you get the role, I suppose? Well, I suppose he liked me and wanted me for it, but at that time, I was just as interested in my career as a director as I was in acting. And I was directing a, an off-Broadway show. And they asked me to do Mr. Peepers, just a one shot. And I accepted. And then I realized that I, I would be running myself ragged at my rehearsals for my off-Broadway and so forth. And I asked to get out of it. And they wouldn't let me out. So I had to do both. And that was the luckiest break of my life because they liked me and they wrote the part in permanently then and that was the making of me. Until then I was just a utility infielder, I was just someone around, available, and no one knew my name. Describe your role on the show for those who aren't aware of Mr. Peepers. Well the reason they're not aware of it is that it was a live show yes. and the kinescopes that exist are not of broadcast quality today. So there are no repeats. Well we were all school teachers and I, I was a, a know-it-all, a man who was incapable of saying, I don't know. Well, the kind of person who's technically described as a horse's ass. <laughs> and he just, uh, yes, of course, yes, yes, yes. He just nodded. He didn't know anything. He was stupid, but he, he seemed to know everything. And, um, right. And uh, it was very funny, and they wrote very well for me, Fritzell and Greenbaum. It, uh, the show was originally going to be just a summer show, just a few weeks in duration, mm. I believe. Yes, I wasn't on it then. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on it those first few weeks. Oh, okay. And uh, when, the, when they announced it was the last episode of that, of that first period, uh, they got so many calls that they realized they'd better cancel the show that was coming back and keep this mm -hmm. one on. <laughs> Well, uh, it would be a good time perhaps to describe the show's star, Wally Cox, and uh, your, your thoughts of him. Um. Yeah. Wally Cox was the first in a series of partners I worked with, with whom I established a very strong bond. And the way it's happened with Jack Klugman, people often talk to me about it. But it had happened before with Wally, mm -hmm. also with Rock Hudson. Um, Wally had, I knew Wally um, before Mr. Peepers, but only slightly. He wasn't an actor when I first knew him. He was a silversmith. And uh, there were a group of people who used to hang around Maureen Stapleton. She had an apartment on 52nd Street. She lived with two other girls, uh, Mary Welch and uh, Janice Mars. And their home seemed to be a meeting place for all kinds of guys and people in the theater. One of them was Marlon. And his roommate was uh, Wally Cox. They'd known each other since they were little boys. And I, went, I met Wally at um, Ma Maureen's apartment. And uh, someone said, Wally, do your su such and such. And he got up and did a, uh, one of his monologues. And I, I was helpless with laughter. It's what people say, I slid off the chair. Yes. I, I actually slid right off the chair laughing. 
He, for, with his first words, which were, give me your attention, men. He was doing an army sergeant. Give me your attention, men! <laughs> I, I don't I can't get the intonation, but it was exactly the way those sergeants used to sound in the army. And uh, everybody said to him, you should become a, a performer. But uh, he didn't want to do it. And he was right. He shouldn't have become a performer. He was brilliant, but he wasn't happy. He was not happy in the business of being an actor. He was happy when he was a silversmith. Yes. And, and it, it wrecked his life. He was a, an instant success. He, he submitted to the pressure of Marlon and others, but I think principally Marlon, who got him a job in a nightclub doing these same monologues. Mm -hmm. And the next day, he was a star. Did he believe in himself? What, what, what was the cause of his unhappiness, do you believe? He didn't like show business. Mm. He didn't like it at all. He didn't like acting. He didn't like that kind of work. It's hard work. He liked to be his own boss, work in his little smithy, make his beautiful little... He made jewelry. He made beautiful things, which he would then sell. He went and took them in a little chamois bag from store to store on Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue, the expensive shops, and he placed his things, and he made a good living from it. And he was happy doing that. And he wasn't happy as an actor. But the next day, as I said, he was a star. The whole town was talking about him. And NBC signed him. Fred Coe signed him. And then they had to find a show to put him in. And they came up with Mr. Beepers. And it was a hit. And his life was ruined. Did he not, was he not able to continue uh, the silver smithing as a, as a hobby or something? As yes, sounds, he did. Yes, sounds he very did. Sad. He was never, he was never a happy man again. Mm. And he ended destroying himself. Was the mood on the set affected by his unhappiness um, as Mr. Peepers became no. a success? No. Um, we all knew that he was moody. We didn't realize that he was depressed. And um, he would just get withdrawn. And he would try to come back. He was never mean or anything. Mm -hmm. right. He was a lovely person. Well, was the, was the process of doing the comedy live different than the Philco's and all of that? Or perhaps we should break here so we can change tape. Um, and then we'll Talk about the process of doing Mr. Mm -hmm. Peeper's life as a co weekly comedy.